<clears throat> well, thank you, Don, for a uh, very pleasant opportunity to speak today. The, um, the topic I'm going to talk about is uh, leadership, but let me give you some context around, uh, around that just a little bit. When I went to, um, went to work for Oceaneering, it was a public company traded on the NASDAQ. Uh, it was traded for uh, 62 cents a share, and there were 7 million shares outstanding. Um, for the next 25 years, I was active as the CEO of the company, and we grew the share value on a compounded basis of 26% per year for 25 years. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but um, when you translate that to what it actually is, it means that a company that was worth initially $5 million wound up being worth almost $10 billion. Now, there's a lot of money for somebody, and uh, I'm happy our shareholders made the lion's share of that money. But anyway, it's just to kind of bring you up to date. The other thing I want to say about Oceaneering is that it's really a cool company. I know that's not a real executive kind of, of uh, vocabulary, but you know, we do things that other people just don't do. We, uh, we, we are serial number one inventors of innovative type equipment, services, and things that have never been done before. Uh, we started out as a diving company, um, and we became eventually the largest diving company in the world. And I realized that there, you just can't make you know, great returns renting people. You've got to figure out some kind of tools and some kind of things to put, put with those people. So uh, that's what we did. We became the largest uh, operator, manufacturer and operator of remotely operated vehicles. Uh, you can imagine the physiological uh, difficulty in having human intervention in seven, eight, nine, ten thousand feet of water, if it's even physically practical. So anyway, uh, we'll get on our subject of uh, leadership. And I didn't um, um, do a PowerPoint because actually I wanted to sharpen your listening skills a little bit. Communication is 93% um, nonverbal. Now that means that 55% of communication is visual. And, uh, and what you see adds to the credibility or subtracts from the credibility of whoever it is that you're, you're speaking with. And you know, you think about that, you know, I think that, um, I don't know where the 55% came from, but I, I've read it so many times that it's probably close. It's, it probably hadn't been peer reviewed, but uh, it's close. 38% of uh, communication is tonality. You know, sometimes it, you know, when you say yes, you say no, you really mean maybe, and sometimes you say maybe, you mean no. I mean, there's a whole large part of your vocabulary that's based on that tonality. And only 7% of what you say are words that people listen to. So today you're going to have to listen carefully, observe me carefully, whatever non uh, vis or visual signals I give off um, or whatever my tone of voice is, uh, you'll know intuitively, instinctively that um, something I believe in or, or maybe I'm not sure of. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for coming. Uh, yeah, I'm counting on a lot of questions. And, uh, and so if you have a question, let's get it out and talk about it. The, um, the first thing that I thought that, that made any sense to me was that um, leaders and followers need to have a common vision of what is it they're doing. Uh, we don't get that as much as we should. I mean, sometimes you have leaders that are autocratic, sometimes they're democratic, sometimes they're smart, sometimes they're not as smart, sometimes they're knowledgeable, experienced. Uh, incidentally, the difference between experienced and, uh, and smart is pretty wide chasm. It's not really, you, you, you can't get experienced by just being smart. 
you have to have done these tasks. Now, you don't have to be the best one at doing them, but you got to have the empathy with the people that you're asking to do these tasks. For instance, suppose I ask you to um, jump 15 feet high. What would be your first impression? Is this guy crazy? What in the hell is he talking about? But you know Texans, uh, you know, they, they have this spirit about them. Uh, but suppose I added to that, I'll give you $5 million if you jump 15 feet. What would you do? I dare say you would think about it a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't dismiss it quite as quickly as you did uh, my first comment about it. And I said, uh, okay, you can use any technique you want to to try to jump 15 feet. Well, now, 15 feet doesn't look quite as high as it did a few minutes ago. I mean, it's starting to look a little better. $5 million prize, all I got to do is get 15 feet. Incidentally, the world record in the high jump is Moss of minus seven and a half feet, I think, something like that. And, um, but the point is, you're gonna try to do something. So what, what are you doing? You're negotiating. What are the rules of this contest? And that's what a leader does with the followers. The followers say, uh, what's in it for me? Well, here's the task, what's in it for me? Well, here's what you're gonna get. And when you get your first job out of college, what's gonna be in it for you is keeping that first job. It won't be a bonus for every time you do something because you're gonna be expected to do that. So the point I'm trying to make here is that keep an open mind, don't jump to conclusions, and try to jump 15 feet sometimes. And then um, second, we need to determine if the activity is helped more by motivation or is it helped more by the dissemination of knowledge. You know, sometimes you just teach somebody how to do something and they don't need a whole lot of team spirit, teamwork, uh, they just know how to do it. And it works pretty well. Sometimes uh, teaching is not as good. Sometimes hands-on uh, experiential development is, uh, is very important for you. So we need to determine that. Is it more motivation? or is it more knowledge-based? <clears throat> so let me start off with my favorite um, definition of leadership. A leader is someone who sets, helps set the expectation of the followers and helps the followers achieve those expectations. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you know, it's not the whole thing, but it's, a, it's, to me, the most important piece of this thing. What are the key ingredients in success? Well, they're different in each one. One size does not fit all. Some people may need motivation. Some people may need knowledge. You know, if you, if you don't have the knowledge, it's hard to start. If you have the knowledge, it can still be hard to start. Have any of you ever been on a diet? Well, wait until you get to be 73 and you go on a diet. <laughs> you think it's hard to be on a diet now? I'm telling you, it is really hard to be on a diet when you hit my age. And I don't worry too much about it. You know, I lose a few pounds. I, I know where they are. I'll, I'll collect them again, so I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, most of these, these definitions that we're going to talk about today are just things that I've observed. This is not a rigorous um, uh, analysis of behavioral science. Please don't think that I'm an expert in that. I'm, I'm probably not an expert in many things but certainly not behavioral science. Uh, but, I, but I have observed a lot of transactions between individuals, particularly between teams. Um, Don and I were talking before the speech that um, 
Uh, in today's world, and I think Georgia Tech is doing a good job of this, it sure sounds that way, is that the norm in business today is you work in a team. I remember 50, 60 years ago, uh, the, 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 the pat answer was, you know, we need to teach our engineers more about how to communicate, how to write, how to be articulate. And, uh, and you guys did a great job of that. But today, honestly, I think team interaction is one of the key things. I mean, imagine how connected you are. When I used to get off an airplane, I would make a beeline to the first telephone, which uh, then I would get there and realize that all I had was a quarter. And I had to consider, was this call really worth a quarter or could I just get change and get a nickel later on? But I couldn't use this phone because it would be taken up by all the other people on the airplane. I didn't have to call a meeting to make that decision, though. So, <clears throat> Uh, I believe the first task of the leader is to understand what phases of the life cycle. Does anybody know what the life cycle is? It's all the stages that you go through to develop the maturation, the, the, the maturity in your life. There's, um, I was very fortunate um, when I was 26 years old I was invited to participate at the Menninger Foundation um, that um, um, taught, you know, they were one of the, the most famous psychiatric hospitals in the country. Well, this was not a psychiatric need, this was an educational need. <laughs> and, uh, but they, uh, uh, they're the ones that coined the phrase uh, battle fatigue and, and so forth. But uh, they, were, they were firmly convinced that uh, everybody goes through seven phases in your life. First phase is infancy, the last phase is old age. And, um, uh, and they, they committed one day for each of these phases. So you had uh, seven days of lecture, interaction with each other, and you had two days. Uh, I mean, you know, travel for two days. So it was a nine-day course, which is kind of an odd thing. Well, when, uh, when they told me I was going to that, uh, I thought it was going to be about how to get more effort out of people. You, know, you, uh, you think of doing a task, the first thing you think about is how much effort do I need to put into this task and what am I going to get out of it? So when I talked about the reward system, it's not necessarily money. What am I going to get back from this? I'm going to either have a learning experience, I'm going to have a horrible experience because I don't like this person that's on my team. Uh, you know, lots of different answers here, lots of always, always very personal answers. And so the, the um, um, so I, here I go to Topeka and um, uh, all I can say is that when I got off the airplane at, at Kansas City and was driving to uh, Topeka, of those of you that have seen um, The Wizard of Oz, that's what Kansas looks like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a cool place, and, uh, and the Menningers, uh, the, the professors at the Menninger Foundation were really great guys, and, uh, and, and women. And uh, it, was, it was my first encounter with, um, with behavioral science, and I really, Honestly, uh, in, enjoyed it. The, uh, the last day of the class uh, was about old age. And uh, six days of intensive uh, learning about something that I hadn't learned before or I hadn't experienced before was a little more difficult than I expected it to be. And uh, while I was getting my, my act together, this uh, this guy that was a MD, medical doctor, and a PhD from Harvard, and he also happened to be in his late 80s, walks in the door. And he says, I know you guys are tired, and um, what I'm willing to do is I'm willing to give you the three things that are most important in the old age phase, and then let you go. Well, this sounded like a pretty good deal to me. 
And uh, so uh, he walks in and he said, you need three things when you get into the old age phase. The first thing you need is you need uh, your health, both your physical health and your mental health. Well, I was 26 now, I remember that. And uh, I didn't even know there was a mental health. I thought just health was health. And uh, never dawned on me you needed mental health. And the, uh, he said, okay, that works. And uh, the second thing you need is enough money to live the way you have been living. Now, remember, I was 26, and we didn't have enough money to live the way we were living. <laughs> yeah. So that didn't work quite as well. And then he said, the third thing and the most important thing that you need to acquire before you go to the old age phase is you want to acquire some outstanding memories of your life. So I got home uh, after the uh, session was over and uh, talked to Karen about my experience and, uh, and what was the most important thing to, to get us through old age. And, uh, and we decided that we would uh, postpone some of the material pleasures that we had been planning on in our life. The first one, of course, was we decided we would not replace this 15-year-old automobile we had. And uh, that turned out to not be a very good economic decision. <laughs> so anyway, we, uh, we, uh, we took the route of uh, doing that. And, uh, and, and we took our children to uh, some really cool places and developed a lot of memories. To this day, uh, and our kids are, are uh, way older than you guys are, um, they, they still play a game with us called Do You Remember? And so we play this game and we have fun doing it. Do you remember when such and such happened? And uh, it's always kind of fun. Uh, let's see. Okay, now we have this small bit of psychology pretty well hammered out. Everybody understands there's seven phases. Each phase is going to do something for you. Uh, and so if you're the leader of the crowd, um, how do you gain this knowledge about these individuals? You know, you really uh, probably have a hard time understanding what is going on, it's good to understand that the seven phases are there. And then it's also better to understand that in each phase you learn something. Uh, one of the neat things I learned was that in uh, the phase when you're a, uh, an infant, um, it's a, the beginning of trust versus mistrust. And the, uh, the trusting part is when your mom and dad play peekaboo with you, and they put their hands over their face and they say peekaboo and they open their hands, you suddenly reappear. And so when this happens repeatedly, you learn to trust that sound of peekaboo. That that's gonna bring your parents back somehow. And uh, I don't know how that really works, but uh, it seems to be pretty prominent in the literature. But the way I think that you can, uh, can learn what you need to do, how you need to do it, is you observe uh, the, the, the way people react to a variety of situations. You know, how do, how do you react to all the situations you're in? You know, I, I, some th situations that I get in, I react differently in different times, uh, different periods, uh, how you feel, and so forth. So I wouldn't jump to conclusions. I mean, the first impression you have of somebody is important because it is a first impression. But don't pin them down that that's the way they always are. I mean, sometimes you come in, you, you're not feeling good. I remember one time I, I, I was talking to our employees in Norway, and I said, yeah, you know, sometimes you come in and you... Uh, 
you had too much to drink the night before. And, uh, and it landed like a bomb. I mean, it was, uh, I obviously had misspoken in one of the cultural norms. And uh, so I'm looking out there for at least somebody to smile. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I knew I had bombed out on that. And so I said, well, explain to me what it was that I said that, you know, didn't make sense to you. And almost in unison, they all said, well, if you had a hangover, you shouldn't be coming to work anyway. I thought, well, you know, the way I did it is you just sucked it up and did it, you know. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, we got this, got this down. And you got it, you got it. Okay. All right, so we need to kind of wrap up the behavioral side of things. The... Um, um, so you can see that behavioral science is pretty complicated. I mean, it's uh, lots of different paradigms out there, lots of things coming and going, uh, big things, small things, small things that become big, big things that get reduced. Uh, so your life is in a, in a state of kind of constant flux. And the, and the best way to do that is to, is to members of your team, you know, um, watch their reactions to certain phrases or certain visual contact with somebody. Uh, and that gives you a clue as to uh, what is it that is stimulating them, what is it that is pulling them back. And so that's really, I think, the best way uh, to be a good team member is to say, you know, every time we get to this spot, we seem to kind of bog down. And what is it that we need to use to get us over this hump? And I'll be honest with you, I think that behavioral science is complicated, but I personally don't think it's as hard as thermodynamics. <laughs> so, um, let me talk just a minute about um, positive behavior. Those of you that have a naturally positive attitude, I tell you, I envy you to death because it's a wonderful trait to have this naturally positive, that everything is going to turn out okay, you know. And uh, for those of us that, that try to avoid errors, try to correct errors, uh, you know, we don't have quite the same positive belief that everything is going to turn out, turn out well. But if you spend your time trying to develop something like a positive attitude, you can do it. I, I, I used to fly all over the world, I took planes everywhere, and, uh, and so this was the way I practiced that. When I had enjoyed the flight uh, uh, that I was on, I would, as I was exiting the aircraft, I would tell, I would look the, the flight attendants right in the eye, and I would tell them I had a great flight. And this is why I did it. Yeah. Well, you know, these are people that don't get thanked very often. You know, if they're late with the coffee or late with the drink, I mean, uh, uh, you know, watching these, uh, these young ladies uh, work through the the vagaries of dealing with the public. Um, and I thought, and, and they really appreciated that. They really, really, I think, honestly appreciated that. And it helped me. It helped me. It helped me to be able to, to kind of loosen that bond and to say, hey, you know, let's be positive. Let's be really positive. And, uh, and, I, and I remember doing that many times. Uh, Well, I, this is a side comment. It's, uh, if you don't have quite the perfect positive attitude, but you try to improve that, that attitude, um, there is some advantage to having a more stern attitude. And that is that um, uh, you don't necessarily make as many mistakes um, I overheard a colleague of mine one time, somebody had just come to work for the company and uh, 
and uh, and they obviously were talking about me, you know. So I was obviously trying to get closer to hear what it was, <laughs> and uh, and they said, um, "Well, I'll tell you what, you're going to hate his practices. They are terrible. But what you're going to love." is playing in those games because he's going to get you so prepared that everything you see is going to be something you've practiced against. And, uh, and so I think that there's a pragmatic way to do this, and let's call that the pragmatic way. And I think there's also an influential way to do that, and let's call it positive. So again, one size does not fit all. I don't think there's anybody in the world that, uh, that would, would recommend that this is the only way to do something. Uh, so we're going to talk about that in just a second. I also agree, believe that um, uh, for those of us who grew up with parents that um, lived through the Depression and parents that lived through World War II, um, also have a different perspective of, of life. My parents, um, they were always big believer that there was nothing that I did that I couldn't do better. Now, of course, you can imagine as you go from young to old, um, you know, this is, you know, there's gets to be a point that's a little more aggravating than it was uh, earlier. And, um, but, that, but it's, a, it's a true statement. I mean, they are looking for the vagaries of life. I mean, when the, when the depression comes or when the war comes, I mean, you gotta be ready. You gotta, you gotta have a mental attitude that's tough. And, um, and so I think that that was really an important ingredient in, in my life. Okay, so we've got our definition. We've got some behavioral aspects that we wanna do and understand. Uh, and so we're going to now see what leaders and followers can be. And uh, incidentally, at the, the Hyatt lecture, the followers get as many points as the leaders do. It's only in real life where the followers don't get that. The leaders get more rewards because of bigger bloom. I don't know. Sometimes uh, a lot of companies have moved to a... Uh, an interesting track, you know, particularly big companies, where the track is, you know, a technical track or an administrative track, and uh, and you don't have to be the CEO to make the most money. Interesting idea, interesting uh, concept, I think. But um, uh, let's see. Okay, besides besides. Um, the equality here in the lecture series. I would also say that um, in your lifetime, you're not always going to be the leader. Many times you're going to be the follower. And, uh, and so you need to learn what both, both positions are, both, both sides of that equation. And, uh, and I'll promise you this, if you can't play those two positions, you will not be able to stay married 52 years. <laughs> okay, I told you about an encounter I had with a guru in old age that was an expert. Uh, let me tell you about two other people that had a big effect on my life. Um, back in, ni in, the 19, in, the, in the 90s, uh, we bought a fishing camp from um, one of our customers. And we use that fishing camp to, um, to uh, uh, entertain our customers, primarily customers in the, in the oil and gas business. But um, um, I didn't realize it was going to happen, but it did. I wish I could take credit for projecting this and planning it and executing it, but I didn't do that. It's just luck. Incidentally, luck is a big part of everything now. Don't forget that. I mean... Uh, just know this, that good fortune is, is what you're looking for and, uh, and luck plays a big part in your life and how things happen to you. And uh, remember that it is pretty much always your friend. So don't shut luck down. 
Uh, but anyway, this, um, this, this, this fellow that came, or excuse me, this equipment that we bought, this uh, fishing camp, was, uh, was, <clears throat> was, a, um, was a, a nice fishing camp. And um, the biggest thing that we got, the biggest asset that we got from the fishing camp was um, our ability to um, uh, employ the guy that was behind the scenes that did everything that made the thing work. You know, there's always somebody, and boy, you find that person, you know, you're really going to be a smart manager because there's always somebody in an organization that helps stabilize that organization, makes it work. You know, they just, they're, they're, they go around and they make things work. They don't make a lot of noise. They're almost stealth. But they are the kind of people that you love your whole life. And, uh, and this guy uh, made everything work. And uh, shortly after we acquired the assets, we realized that the previous managers had been borrowing things from the camp and not returning them. Well, there's only one punishment for that, and it's uh, just short of execution. But um, you do have to get rid of those people. And so I went to Ike and I said, and Ike was a gentleman I'm talking about. I said, would you like to try <clears throat> and run this camp? His first response to me, he said, well, I don't know if I can run it. <clears throat> I said, well, Ike, I don't know if you can run it either. I'm asking you, can't, do you want to try? That's all I'm asking. You want to try or not try? Because I know if you don't want to try, then we got a failure if I put you in that role. If you want to try, I don't know what the odds are that you're going to be successful, but I know we at least got a chance. And so he, so he decided that he would try. And um, this was the part that I hadn't planned on. This was a guy that his skill set was not in thermodynamics. His skill set was in intuitive understanding of human behavior. This guy could literally read your mind. And it was really, really a, a great trade for me because I would sit with him for hours learning how to do that, learning how to do that. And, uh, and a lot of it was uh, uh, visual, a lot of it was eyesight. How did, how did a person do? I mean, if you walk up to somebody and they turn their back on you, um, uh, you know, and, and some customers did that more than others. Some of them never did it, of course. Uh, and we had really nice customers. Um, so, so anyway, Ike helped us transform this company from a small company of divers to a very technical company that had markets in every worldwide country that you can imagine. And, uh, and he did all of that by taking people fishing and helping them have a good time. Second uh, encounter I had with some, uh, some really great uh, leadership was uh, I was in Iraq a few years ago, several years ago, and uh, the major general that was in charge of the ground forces, combat ground forces in uh, Afghanistan, uh, he and I stayed up till four o'clock in the morning talking about things. And we had a lot in common, and, uh, and I really enjoyed uh, listening to him. And uh, uh, so I finally asked him, I said, how do you get people to risk what they are risking over here in Afghanistan? I mean, walking outside is dangerous. I said, how do you get people to do that? He said, the U.S. military has got training programs that identify people and that um, uh, train them to understand risk assessment, uh, tactics, and so forth. And he said, the more you know about that, the more confident that you are that you're not going to be a victim of the circumstances. And I said, well, I don't know, man. I'm, I, uh, I'm not sure that that works. Um, I know it works, but I'm not sure how it works. 
And he said, um, he said, well, it works. He said, for instance, over here in Iraq, our firefights only last a few minutes. He said, everybody uh, that is in the organizational unit, whether it's a squad or it's a platoon or it's a whole company of men, um, how they react to it initially is key to what happens. He said, the leader of that group, his, his, uh, his body will be going at, at full speed ahead. He'll be running right along with everybody else. But his mind will slow down and it will allow him to assess the battle scene. Where are the bad guys? Where are my guys? Where's the best cover? What do I do to protect them? So this lesson in leadership is about you got to take what you got. You don't get a chance to, to tee it up, line it up. You got to take what the situation is giving you. And you can't change that until you've assessed that situation, you understand that situation, and then you can do something about it. But you can't just start doing something about it. So anyway, that was a great experience for me, and I, um, <clears throat> I owe that guy a lot. So. Okay. Okay, I don't know if you'll enjoy this story or not, but it's, it's one of my stories. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, there was a, um, a football game that I played in when I was in college. And, <clears throat> and I remember that I recovered a fumble in the game. Uh, it was a crucial moment in the game, and it was... Uh, uh, they're all crucial moments, aren't they? <laughs> and uh, and the uh, and so anyway, I, I came across a line of scrimmage, and I looked down line of scrimmage, and the quarterback had juggled was mishandling the the snap from center, and uh, and so he was preoccupied with being sure he got both his hands on the ball, and that he had secured the ball, and I saw a path right to him, and um, and I took out after him. He saw me come and he goes and jukes around. And anyway, bottom line was I chased him down. I made him fumble. I recovered the fumble. All right, now, you got to think this is uh, something just slightly short of hero heroism. I mean, this is, uh, this is as close as it gets in, in, uh, in my life. And, uh, and so, I grabbed the ball, I, I tuck it under my arm, I was holding that thing so tight and they couldn't have got it back for whatever they had done. And I'm heading over to the sideline thinking, man, what a play. Am, am I gonna be rewarded with a ticker tape parade now or is it gonna be later? I mean, this is some, my position coach had moved down the sideline and, uh, and was now 10 yards on the field. And I heard him yell at me, what in the hell are you doing? Well, I knew that was a rhetorical question and he really didn't expect an answer. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I jogged on over to the, the uh, sideline. He said, what are you doing? That's not what you're supposed to do. Not what I'm supposed to do. I knew that I hadn't done exactly right, but I thought I had done the right thing. And, uh, and he, says, he said, look, man, we don't need any more risk. You know, if we're going to win this ball game, we don't need you taking off doing something freelance that's not required. What your job was to cover the back coming out of the backfield. And uh, incidentally, I played defensive end. And so you had to come, you had to cover this back. Well, that pretty much cinched it for me. I, look, I caused a fumble, recovered the fumble, and, um, 
and, uh, and we got a position to win the game, and you're telling me I should cover this back? I mean, this guy will run 4-4-40. He was already 10 yards ahead of me. I had absolutely no chance of covering him. I mean, it was, it was a no chance to do that. So anyway, um, there was a tense moment on the sideline with the coach, and um, I readily agreed with him that I had made a mistake. And uh, so Monday, the postscript of the story was that, that uh, Monday after we watched the film, uh, he came over to me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, he said, you know, I've, I've coached several uh, All-Americans here uh, at Rice. And, um, and they had the same spirit of taking on more risk. And, uh, and, uh, but they did just fine. So I thought, man, that's pretty good. And then he looked at me and he said, but you need to be really careful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that meant what it meant, but um, anyway. All right. Uh, okay, one more leadership story. Let's see if it makes any sense to you. Um, uh, many, many years ago, I was in a group um, called the American Leadership Forum. It was a group that was formed by um, Joe Jaworski and spread to a lot of cities in America. And it was a, they took people in the community and uh, ask us to write the series of things. What did it take to make Houston a world-class city? And then we had to uh, agree in a consensus format. We weren't allowed to like vote, you know, 22 to 10. It, you know, you had to have a consensus, and we had to all agree that we had enough in the in the in the end game that uh, that we could be part of this. We didn't agree with everything. And, uh, and, and we might have even voted against it. Uh, but uh, consensus, it was really interesting. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into politics, so don't worry. Um, but the, the consensus was, you know, that you could accept all of the negative things from your perspective as long as you had the positive things in there. And it, and it kind of worked for you, and, and it worked pretty well. So. So anyway, we, uh, we met once a month for a weekend, and then at the end of the year, we met for one week at uh, an Outward Bound School uh, for adventure and so forth. So it was a very eclectic group of, um, of people. It was businessmen, teachers, you know, religious people, uh, not-for-profit folks. I mean, really, really a great group of people, multi-diverse. Uh, Great, great people. And uh, we all had a really good time together. So we get to the, uh, the last day of the, of the retreat in uh, Colorado where we were doing this Outward Bound adventure. And uh, uh, I was teamed up with a, federal judge, a newly appointed federal judge. Uh, hadn't been confirmed yet. This was during the Clinton administration. And so we, uh, we discussed the situation and, uh, and we decided that we would um, go as far, and the question was, success was going to be graded by how well you did versus your consensus instead of like reaching the top of the mountain. But you know, the truth of the matter is that there's usually somewhere between almost everybody and everybody that has this competitive spirit that we all wanted to get to the top of the mountain. And those of us that were real competitive wanted to get to the top of the mountain first. And so that was a secondary kind of objective that we had. And um, so we get up to the, uh, within 300 feet of the summit and she just plops down. And uh, so I plop down. And she said, no, 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 go on without me. Oh, I can't. We didn't agree to that. That's not what we agreed to. We agreed that we would go as far as we could as a team. And that's what we agreed. That's what we're going to do. Okay. 
Let's not worry about it. We we have succeeded. Now, I don't know if we're going to win, but we succeeded. We have succeeded. This is as far as we can go. I have chosen to respect your wishes to not go any further. See, there. Are, that's why, again, I could be married 52 years. Yeah. <laughs> OK. All right. And uh, so the. Uh, uh, she she said, OK, OK, let me have some time. So she gets up a few minutes later and she says, oh, let's walk around a little bit. OK, walked around and she finally says, um, I really want you to go to the top. I know you really want to go to the top. I said, no, I, I don't want to go to the top as much as I want to win the consensus here. That's what I want to do. She said, OK, then we'll stay here. Of course, I was heartbroken. And, uh, and then, uh, so she sat down, I sat down, and, uh, and she, I'm sorry, we, we're, this is the last story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, she looks at me, she said, let's go together. So we went together, we made it to the top. We weren't the first ones, but we, we made it to the top. Summary, quickly, 45 seconds. Uh, leadership is hard. Don't listen to anybody that tells you it's easy, that they're natural leaders and everything works out. It's hard because you're dealing with complex human emotions. You know, what's in it for me? I mean, that sounded kind of coarse to you, but it's not about money. Sometimes it's about money, but it's not always about money. Sometimes it's about who gets credit. You know, in the academic world, it's who his name is on the, the top of the list. Isn't that right? Something like that. Okay. It's a, so it's complicated. You've got to satisfy a lot of different needs. Your needs, your partner's needs, greater needs in the, in the world. And uh, so it's really hard. And uh, one size does not fit all. Now, the worst thing you can do is be whatever somebody wants you to be. Because then you become not believable. And you don't have your heart in it. And so you, you can't do that. You've got to draw a line someplace. But it doesn't have to be such a hard line that it doesn't meander just a little bit. But if it goes like this, nobody's going to follow you. You can't go in and dictate something and then uh, expect it to work. Anyway, let me say it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, I look forward to some questions uh, later and um, uh, I hope you can, I hope you learn something. So thank you. And the answer is, uh, for us, uh, Oceaneering is a premier all-service company. But the oil markets are changing dramatically. There's new types of uh, hydrogen being uh, essentially harvested in, uh, in the West Texas and all the shale deposits. You probably heard something about that. It's a manufacturing process. Well, I tell you, you go out to Midland, Texas, you are not going to find any water depths uh, greater than in, in the eight to 10,000 foot range. They, they just don't have anything out there like that. So we are completely shut out of that market. So what I want to do is, this, is kind of a repeat of what we did the first time, and that is uh, change our markets. You know, we, we, um, we, we should have technical markets in robotics, uh, maybe some types of software, uh, that, we, uh, that we're good at, uh, we, we're good at manufacturing prototypes, um, and we should be in, in different markets than, than only the oil and gas business. And we are, we are, <clears throat> and we have been for some time, uh, but we're getting uh, a lot, lot more important than doing that. Thanks, thanks for asking that question.